The next session is MG Chronicles of a Culture. We have MT Vasudevan and Geeta Krishna Kuti. This session will be moderated by CP Surendran. He is the editor of DNA, chief editor of DNA, novelist and poet. So I hand over the stage to them. So once again, Empty Chronicles of a Culture with Empty Vasudevan Naya, Geeta Krishna Kuti, moderated by C.P. Surendra. Is the mic on? Can you hear me in the back? Although I come from Kerala, I've been four or three decades been out of that state. And I come from a fairly literary family. My own father was a fairly well-known writer and a critic. And uh, his favorite writer was Empty. And I come from a certain part of Kerala called Palakkad. Palakkad is the northern, uh, say, not towards the north of Kerala. And. Uh, one of the things which actually decides and determines the fate of Palakkad is a river, which is about 150 kilometers odd, which flows through northern part of Kerala. Uh, as Hemingway to fishing, I would think that MT's uh, basic idea of writing has been shaped by that river. I suppose what he angled in there was for words. I think 1953 was when he wrote his first uh, collection of short stories. And uh, that made a huge amount of sensation because it was a whole together different kind of delivery of speech, a very strong colloquial uh, uh, resort towards language. Uh, and on the whole, he brought in a new sensibility to Malayalam writing. Uh, my own feeling is that the great contribution of M.T. Vasudevan Nair in Malayalam literature is that, contrary to what people think, it is not the disintegration of the so-called joint uh, Nair family. I think it is more like Nair's fighting against Nair's. Now, I don't know how many of you people know who Nair's are. They're a tribe, let's say. Uh, perhaps uh, a warlike tribe, especially when it comes to words. Uh, but a cantankerous, uh, extremely tribalistic, um, <laughs> totem and taboo driven bunch of people. Avoid them if you can. <laughs> Now, uh, MT is a Nair himself. Uh, so am I. Uh, the, 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 the whole thing there was, you know, you used to have this huge bunch of uh, Nair chieftains running uh, whole belts of uh, Kerala, especially in the north. 
and there will be one guy, one youngster, breaking away from that, the way it was run, the way the, 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 the so-called big uncles run the place. Normally, it is the big brother of the mother. In Kerala, the whole place is run along matrilineal uh, lines, which basically means that money comes to the, uh, through the mother's side. So you would have this uh, very strange uh, guy coming up, uh, youngster coming up and fighting against the structure of the Nair family. And normally he goes out into the city. The problem with MT's writing then as now is that he's still not happy when he goes into the city, going away from the structure uh, against which he has rebelled. He's still not very happy. After a series of novels and short stories like that, revolving around that theme, MT moved into film writing, film di direction. For example, his first movie uh, called Nirmalian in 1973 won the uh, national award. Uh, it is a very visceral look at a small temple priest and what it means to be a starved, impoverished devotee of God, a helpless God, who doesn't, of course, help him at all at any given point in time. So uh, MT's um, terrain is vast. It moves from novel fiction, uh, imaginative fiction, like the second turn, which was a reinterpretation of uh, Mahabharata, through the perspective of Bhima. And from then on, he has, uh, he has done several things, short stories, movies, um, travel writing. And he has come to this point where he's looking at you and wondering, what the hell is this guy talking? So I wouldn't want to speak much on this, because the man himself is here. And Gita has a very um, assiduous, faithful translator of his. I would like MT to talk a, uh, a little about himself and his idea of writing, and then Gita can speak to him, and then we shall take it as it goes. Yeah, so what I'm going to ask MT as a, someone whom I admire a lot is that You know, I feel uh, the present context of fiction writing in India, and I suppose to a large extent abroad, there's a huge amount of flux and fluidity happening. Uh, I would think that local themes are giving away to global themes, and I would think that there's a huge tendency of pressure on writers and publishers at large to look for big themes for the simple reason that they're looking for a bigger market. So are the narrative voices which you would have invented when you were relatively young uh, and the native flavors, are these going out of fashion? And are we talking about an increasing <coughs> movement towards a large <coughs> grand narrative wiping out the individual strains? See, first of all, I, I don't have any literary background in the family. I was uh, born and brought up in an agricultural, lower level agricultural family. Books, a very rare thing. Uh, and the children, if they are able to recite Adhyatma Ramayana of Adhyatma without faltering, the elders will consider this boy has come of education is okay, fine. And uh, another thing was um, my village, my house is by this side. There are paddy fields, other side is the river, Panthapur. 
So the seniors will have to take the cattle to the river for bathing them. On either side, there will be paddy fields. Paddy in different stages. So there's a small bun. Along with that, you have to drive the cattle through the bun without giving them a chance to bite the paddy. So the two seniors will not be able to do it, two uncles. So they will call whoever is there, a boy, come help. So he has to drive along with the seniors, the cattle across. And if they find the boy is okay, driving the cattle to the river. They won't say anything, but in their look, there will be that appreciation. Yes, he is good of age. He has come of age. That was the background. Of course, where from you get magazines from far off places, books from far off places. So reading, that gave me the idea to write and it was a game. I don't, I didn't have much friends of my age in my family or nearby. So I could, this was a game I could play alone. Thinking of my stories or thinking of my poems. And I will go on experimenting. I, I don't know where the newspapers are. I don't know the address. I want to ask you one question. Um, Hemingway kept talking about uh, the, the nature of a wound of a writer. What was the nature of your wound? Wound? Yes. Loneliness. Loneliness when? Then at some stage, hunger. Hunger makes you write? <laughs> that is a wound. Yeah. <laughs> that is a wound. Yeah. Not enough food means a wound. Yeah. Yeah. Some of my stories are based on that. Like Karkadagam. Yeah. When we don't have enough rice, some distant uh, cousin from the father's side, he visits. The mother is panicky. Oh, they are big people. We have to feed them properly. And we don't get food there. That food, special food or rice, it is given to the visitor to please him, not to, because we, we people are not that bad, they should have that impression, That's because right, yeah. they are coming from the father's side. So hunger, then if you write something, you have to post it to some magazine address which is available with you. Three-fourth of an anna is the book post. Yeah. How to get three-fourth of an anna? Not, not an easy thing. No, it's not. You can't ask your mother. She, she will not have that money. So somehow you will get that, that little money. You try your luck, post it. It may not be accepted, but after se several attempts, maybe one will be published. Gita, uh, can I just ask one more question before I leave the... Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, you know, I still would like to know from your perspective, you know, what the answer might be on uh, the narratives of the novel shifting, not just with age and time, but I would think that more than ever, uh, the idea of the market, I don't think not even marketing real forces, the idea of market exerts a huge influence in terms of shaping your imagination. And that has come to a point where you tend not even to think about a few things which you might have thought of as a real thing, say, 10, 15 years ago. So do you think that is affecting the idea of writing all, all over the place? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. So there are still things of the past inside me all right. which I have not recorded. It is very much there hurting me. At some time, I may sit at it. Because this uh, 
matrilineal problems which I have described in some of my works. I was not a witness to that. Those were the stories told by my mother or my grandmother, not to me, but when they had their session, they used to tell the cruel uncles who dominated, who made their life miserable. So such stories in your childhood you have collected, you have kept it. Later on I have used it. Not directly they have not told me, but I was, when I was a boy, I was witnessing the, the, the last stages of matrilineal system. <laughs> but there are still stories in that period. Do you think people would be able to relate to those stories now? It will. Mm. Yeah. Because after all human stories, yeah. somebody is suffering, somebody is vengeance. Those things are human stories. How do you move, move from you know, fiction to movies? I think you've done over 50 screenplays, and most of them are award-winning screenplays. So uh, do you find a different kind of satisfaction, or do you think it is a whole um, you know, seamless uh, train of the imagination? No. no, it was by an accident, actually. I didn't want to write for films at all. Some good, some close friends insisted, your, this particular story is good for a film. I said, okay, you take the story. I give you permission of the right, whatever it is, agreement to. And you, there are professional people, you engage them. But see, these friends insisted, I must write. So I wrote one, became a success, then other people came. So that's how, not that. If somebody asks me which do you prefer, I will always prefer writing, not film writing. Gita? Well, taking off from what both of you said, I Speak think... I think what is important is the, the, the figure of the, the lonely, the black sheep of the family. It could, it's most often a boy, but sometimes rarely also a woman, who has uh, different hopes, different ambitions, different feelings, different emotions from the rest of the family, and who tries to pursue this path and is always ignored, often humiliated, cast aside, and that runs like a steady thread through most of the stories, most of the novels, culminates, I thought, in the figure of Bhima of the Mahabharata, who is also treated as a, um, as a stupid adult. They don't care for him. They only want him to protect them physically. Otherwise, they have no respect for him, and they show it. So this thread right, runs right through all his work. And I think it's the essence of what he said, you know, the, the feeling of loneliness, which is why many people find or say that his work is autobiographical. It is to the extent that he is expressing his own feelings through the feelings of these characters, and of course of the village and its landscapes. You know, uh, I would have thought that even a reinterpretation of a heroic figure like Bhima in Mahabharata, even I thought even there, uh, MT had made him into some sort of a Nair. Exactly. You know, Bhima Nair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So, uh, and I thought that was rather well done, although I yeah. think uh, of late there has been quite a few uh, uh, reinterpretation of their role, especially I think there are one or two versions doing the rounds online without giving MT the credit. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Hmm? You know, there is a... I don't know. I don't know anything. Uh, people said some unauthorized adaptations have come. But do you think that is the danger of the, the virtual world? I mean, you don't have to give people uh, their due respect you know, you just go ahead and do your stuff online, you can put it online, that's it. So do you think it is part of the new technological world that kind of uh, uh, sort of 
not very sensitive to uh, intellectual property rights. <laughs> That's a big problem. Many of the, uh, the legal profession, they don't know much about this. Uh, rights and wrongs. But my feeling is, let it be there. But somebody wants to read my book, they have to read my book. What's the, what's the book you're working on now, apart from the... No, film, no, I am... I had a beginner a fiction. Again, village background. Uh, sometime back. I had to stop it somewhere because of personal illness and now I have started it once again. MJ, I want to ask you a question. Do villages exist anymore? Because you know, when you keep talking about villages, whether it's uh, Indian, Kerala or global, there is a um, huge urbanization happening, not necessarily in terms of cars and buses, but in terms of exposure to different uh, or differently advanced world all over the place. So, do you think this idea of village works anymore? The idea of innocence, does it work no, anymore? You can, you can, you can, you can uh, write about it as a dream, a lost dream. There is no village as such. Ah. The village about which I wrote, when I go to my village, I don't see it anymore. I don't see those people also. Those people, they were very liberal, without any caste consciousness or religious bent. That section I don't see now. You know, that village is lost. You know, uh, in one of your novels, I think it's called The Demon Seed, if I'm not mistaken, there's an imaginary village called Kerakemuri, which means the eastern province, roughly speaking. Uh, why did you have that, that you know, a lot of people here mm. uh, in this festival, some of them are publishers, some of them are agents, for quite a few of them at least, uh, ideas like imaginary cities, imaginary villages do not work. Why would you about, you know, half a century ago, when you are actually very much rooted in a village from Kerala, mm -hmm. why would you reinvent uh, another village for uh, literary functions? The Kerala Muri was one of them, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So why would you do that? Why did you reinvent the village when you could have actually gone into the existing villages and talked about it? No, that's what I had been writing. My fiction, I had been writing about that. Like uh, Asuravit, ah, yeah. uh, when there was the cholera in 1942 in the villages, and people forgot about the religious uh, disparities and things like that. They all came to because there is a, there is a, there is a, a danger, a calamity happening to the humanity around. So they all joined together in the festivals. Nobody considered Hindu festival, Muslim festival like that. It's a festival of the village. Everybody participated. So that imaginary village was there. Very much there. That is lost now because urbanization on one side, but then a uh, lot of uh, external money coming in, affluence is there. So that village is lost. So I cannot reinvent that village, but if I find similar things somewhere, I'll be happy. I may write about it. Yeah, moving off, uh, moving back to uh, your... One thing, uh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. please. Sorry. In between, Gita said something about the black sheep. Yeah. I was never a black sheep. Not you, I not you. I didn't mean you. <laughs> <laughs> but you are not white sheep either. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you were sympathetic to the black sheep. Yeah. You were sympathetic to the black sheep. <laughs> are you, in your writing, are you a feminist, a humanist, or a male chauvinist? What are you? <laughs> no, I can't. I can't label my writing like that. All right. 
I cannot. I think you tend to be a chauvinist. That's good. It's in my dictionary. <laughs> Gita, ask. Okay, you were talking about the transition from um, fiction into film. So it's very interesting to see how some of the short stories have been turned into film scripts. You have the, you know, a germ of a, of a film there, and then it's extended into the film. And uh, it's um, uh, extremely interesting to see that transition from the genre of the short story into mm -hmm. the screen script and how he deals with it. Do you keep up with the latest trends in movie making? Are you, are you still watching a lot of movies internationally and otherwise? Yes, to a certain extent. To a certain extent. I know what is happening all over. And are you working on any screenplays now? No, 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 no. I am gradually drifting away from it. Drifting away from screenplays or from screen writing? Screenplays, screenplays. Right, all right. So what would be your ideal novel, uh, apart from your own genre? What would be your idea? What is the most inspirational novel you have read? How does novel function for you? Is it a, a, a British novel, an American novel, a Latin American novel? Is it a Malayalam novel? Novels are always alive. Latin American novels are for you. Um, they are very much alive, vibrant. Um, I would like to. So why I stopped this last novel, which I am working. On one side I had um, ailments and things like that. I thought that should not be the way, so I started rewriting it. So rewriting, writing, that will go on. There is no end. And I can't say this, I have reached the perfection. Perfection is somewhere there. I may reach there once. I'm not sure. But yet I have to go on trying for it. That is my attitude. I want to ask you two questions which have uh, only very indirectly connected with the idea of writing. Do you believe in God? Are you afraid of death? I believe in God. You do? And are you afraid of death? No. Wow. It is a, it's a part of life. That's terrifying. You know, I can't ask <laughs> <laughs> what I would like to ask you is, you are still writing a column in the Madhubhumi about your reminiscences. Are, are they inexhaustible reminiscences of your childhood and your village? Because you keep writing. You know, there are still so many uh, several, that unwritten? Several, there are several characters there. Yeah. Maybe they are dead, but they are in search of me. Whenever I go there, I <laughs> see them here, there. <laughs> they are in search of me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a never-ending story. <laughs> it is, but you know, um, but I often feel that sometimes as a writer, you know, you come across some sort of a stumbling block. Now, is that, uh, you know, I'm sure it must have happened to you at least once or twice in your life. Uh, is that uh, thing an internal thing or is it something which comes to you from outside? Do you have a sense of, uh, uh, you know, purposelessness? You know, for example, I'm reading a book right now. In fact, I've been trying to read a book uh, for the last two months. It's a monster of a book. His name is... Uh, the Man Without Qualities by Robert <coughs> Musil. Uh, he took about 10 or 15 years to write it, and the full edition came, I think, after his death in 1942. Musil had a whole chain of problems. He was, his contemporaries was Thomas Mann, and he thought Thomas Mann was much inferior to him. And I think Thomas Mann actually acknowledged that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, this is a very complex, uh, intellectually idea-driven kind of book. And constantly, you know, that you can see the author trying to fight over great arts in terms of believing in his own project. And he uh, sort of disperses his um, uh, nihilism or, you know, the, the, the faithlessness of it in the idea of humanity across the characters. Does that happen to you as well? 
do you like your characters or do you have a cynical distance with them? Uh, are you fond of them? Do you have a problem in dismissing them or killing them after a second chapter? How do you look at this whole idea of creating and how do you go on with believing in it? I try to understand them. Uh, why they did why they did that. So I try to understand them. I have a, yeah, I create an empathy with them. And regarding the pressure, the pressure is from within. One, the selection of the material, the, the, the pressure, starts right from the what area you are going to work then how you are going to present it that is a second pressure and third you are you have to find the suitable language for it that's right yeah. that excuse me student mm -hmm. i don't see musil at all in his writing because um, in mt's writing the characters are deeply involved, they're not cynical. They are deeply involved in their own world, in their own emotions, in untangling those emotions or grappling with them. And it's not, it's not that kind of world that you're talking of in New Zealand. I know the book. Yeah. No, sometimes you feel so much uh, sympathy for certain guys. Exactly, exactly. Beeman Nair, <laughs> yes, he's <Surrender. laughs> I would like to call him Beeman Rakshasa. <laughs> he was, uh, he married a Rakshasa lady. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So he was more identified with the, uh, the Rakshasa tribes. Um, right from the beginning, uh, when I read the ep we all asked about mm, children. We used to, we have uh, heard about the Mahabharata uh, story and all that. But when you, the, they developed Mahabharata, the full fledged thing, after much, after years you read, then you go on, uh, you, you are thoroughly disturbed. Of course. When Abhimanyu died, the whole, Barracks, the, the mili that base, military base. Everybody was weeping. Such a brilliant boy, what a great fight he did. And after that, when Gadar Gadar died, everybody is weeping. The, the eldest man said, oh, what a wonderful boy, what a war he did. Then Krishna tells, why, why you are weeping? After all, he was a Rajasana. Any, I would have killed him anyhow. <laughs> he is on my hit list. So why celebrate? These things disturb you. Very much disturb you. So after some time you go on playing with that idea. This, this man, when the, uh, the war was declared, and so and so, so this army is coming, that army is coming to, uh, to that side. Then the old man says, forget about all these things. I am not bothered about it. The Rasha says, <coughs> I cannot sleep. So long uh, as that Bhima is in their camp, yeah. I cannot sleep. This is the, so all these things, this man did not get what he deserved. That feeling was there. But that's a feeling I think uh, most of your novels have, you know? Yeah. The people not getting what they actually what they deserve. But my question actually to you is that although <coughs> I'm not very clear about <coughs> all the characters in your corpus, <coughs> um, what do they deserve? Hmm? What do people deserve? I mean, like, you know, if there is Vasu or in the Asadavita, mm. Um, in any of this um, uh, in imaginary landscape mm. or outside it, do people normally get what they deserve? So why are you actually empathizing in terms of 
Is it, a, is it, is it has it to do no, with no, the sense of balance getting, and justice? No, no, they are not getting what they deserve. So you feel you can't uh, you can't rectify it. Uh, yet you feel uh, sorry or you feel very bad about it. You cannot uh, find so an alternate solution. Give them the girl they love. Give them the uh, part of the property they uh, no. That is not. The, somehow you feel disturbed. That disturbance is moving me. May I say, it's not, it's not a question of what they deserve, but what they think they deserve. Yeah, well, you know, I was referring to a sense of, uh, you know, a sense of ethics in this thing. You know, you know he, he believes that there has to be a, you know, a, a, a more just value system, at least inside the, his imagination. I don't think he discusses no? a system like no? that. No? I don't think so. I don't think so. I simply think that, you know, um, it's a very human feeling that, you know, you, you do your best, you, you give of your best, and yet you think that what comes back to you is not what you deserve. It may be right, it may be wrong. I know, from here starts some of the revolts. Yeah. With the matrilineal system, the revolt started from this. The women not getting proper food, not getting the proper uh, measure of rice, weekly quota. So the younger uh, people do not get enough clothes or food. So from that the revolt started. My grandmother, they were telling the stories which I have used in. Uh, somewhere. One day the youngsters said, the women folk, there will be lot of cries and this thing from the outhouse. Close the doors. Don't open the door. Many things, many sounds may come. Actually, that uh, uh, ruler uncle, he was a very tough guy, very cruel. He was uh, given uh, meat mixed with arsenic. So that was the sound coming from there. But the youngster said, don't open the door. Many things will happen. Nestle was found dead. This happened in the family. My grandmother was a witness. So, such revolts come because of the discrimination. Such revolts come. The, that system broke down because of the discrimination. It was a good system, actually. The, the female, the eldest Inherence. female ruling the, 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 the family means... She doesn't really rule, though. Wonderful system. But they could not go out to the fields and no. supervise him. They are entrusted to their brothers. They spoiled the whole system. And gradually it, it was, uh, it declined. So in a close to, uh, I mean, little over a half a century of writing and involvement, uh, from a present uh, perspective, uh, I remember, I think, uh, about a few years ago, Perhaps it was not directly uh, credited to you, but I remember there's a sentence or two which uh, said uh, that you wondered what was all this suffering for? Uh, you know, probably the one you witnessed or the one you participated in it. Do you think all those things are now worth it? Or maybe the idea of writing itself is not very valid anymore? No, it is, uh, I won't say it is uh, not valid, but it's a, it's a lesson this happened in history. Sometimes these things become part of the history also, the social order when you do. So if you go on like this, this, these things may happen. So you have to, somebody has to record what has really happened in those days. Like the killing of the Grand Angela Chumma. Don't go that side. Down to the street, you will hear. I have not 
I have not, I am, I have never been a direct witness to all these things. My mother used to tell others, my grandmother used to tell others, not for us, they have nightly gatherings, so and so and so was alive, such a thing happened. So I, I heard those things, I kept it for myself. Some have used, maybe there are many both things to use. Yes, um, I don't quite agree with you that he's extremely chauvinistic. I didn't say he was extremely <laughs> chauvinistic. <laughs> but anyway, it I, I said that I point, saw, yeah. I detect, I yeah. detect a, a sense of chauvinism in his yeah. characters, yeah. and I agree with that because I am a bit of a chauvinist myself. That's I what know. I said. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, what I wanted to say is that uh, you know when people talk of the matrilinear theory, they are always very impressed that the woman inherits the property and has all the power. In point of fact, and that he brings out again and again in the stories, the women who come back, like the, wid the, the widow who comes back to the uh, mother's house, often doesn't have any power at all. She has to beg even for her food. And he's brought that out in more than one of his short stories and novels, that she lives at the mercy of perhaps the carnival, the senior male member who administers the, the property and the money, or of you know older women in the household. So there's a kind of an imbalance in, you know, in that, that theory that the matrilineal system gives women all the power all the time. Yeah, that's not yeah, true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, this uh, family structure, feudalism, property, that's fine. But I would have thought that one of the, not lacune, but I would have thought one of the uh, interesting gaps in MT's uh, writing is that his reluctance to either participate or comment directly on politics. You want to explain yeah. that? Uh, I too have wanted to ask you. Uh, yes, uh, because um, I will not, um, the, re the very simple reason is the village in which I grew up, there was no political activity. <coughs> if that time there were some active people there, I would have watched them or I would have moved with them. There was never, never such a thing in my Kodalur or the nearby villages. So I didn't get a, an opportunity to move with them or to study them from a close quarters. That is the reason. Otherwise, I would have written certain political things in that time. <coughs> that was the reason. So the, that will, the setup of the village was like that. Yeah, but you are also, uh, as some of you might know, uh, MT was also a, a great path-breaking editor of uh, quite a few papers and magazines. And, but even as a journalist, you were not really politically, uh, at least overtly conscious. You know, uh, uh, my journalism activity, I was more concerned about literary journalism. Very much concerned with literary journalism. I remember one line that, you know, MP Narayana Pillai, who is my, uh, a great writer from Kerala, of course, none of you, probably none of you knows about him. Uh, when he wrote his first short story mm, and sent mm, it to you, mm. uh, you had a sense of, a thrill of discovery about that whole mm, short story. Mm. Do you have that current going through you now, these days? You know, I'm not concerned with journalism now. It, uh, That's it. That time it was a, you know, it's a dreary job, journalism. You have to read hundred subscripts every day. Yeah. Boring. Ultimately, after a couple of days, uh, after three, three days, four days, one evening, when you come out of the office, you are, you relieved that day, you were able to, whether it's a newcomer or some yeah. new stuff. That's come, yeah. You read it. You are happy. Then maybe to one or two friends you will say. Boring day, but today I was able to read a story. New man, I don't know who he is, but the story was excellent. One last question from my side. On the whole, are you happy with what you have done with your life? 
or I'll give you more happiness. <coughs> Always there is chance for improvement. <laughs> Uh, if Gita has no questions, I think I'll open to the <coughs> audience. To the audience. Yep. Mike. Just one question. It is it's connected to both the wealth and transportation. Okay, I'm told we just have five minutes left. Uh, my questions basically, I am a Malayali who is uh, read MT through Gita. So uh, my understanding of uh, MT, I communicate better in English, I read better in English. My question to Gita is, when you translate something so intrinsically local with so much of local flavor, how were you able to communicate that to people who have no understanding of matriarchy, matrilineal, uh, you know, the kind of setup that our society has, the chauvinism that you spoke about, which I see in my father, grandfather, and others. And it's so beautifully said. So do you add uh, a bit of you into his language? And the question to MT sir is, have you read your translations that Gita has done? Have you uh, found something new in them which you wouldn't have thought of when you wrote it? Gita, you must answer this. Uh, well, I try to convey mood, atmosphere. I don't know whether I'm successful. That's for you to say. Thank you. <laughs> I'll leave it to him to answer the other question. Her, her, her question was that, you know, you must have read a lot of uh, translations of your own work. Hmm. Actually, one and one are you sort of uh, happy in terms of... Uh, I, I no have one other two. will be satisfied <laughs> with his translation. <laughs> But here is somebody who is prepared to go through my text. Get back to me if there are any doubts or clarification. Again, Marconi, she is doing a wonderful job. Better. <laughs> uh, you can, you know, there are other, I have got friends from other areas. Uh, I cannot, they cannot read Malayalam, what I have, I have, originally, I have originally written. So I can immediately say, uh, yes, this is a book, now come. So, that way, <laughs> Gita, especially Gita, I have sort of translated, uh, she has done uh, wonderful things I think to my writing. More questions coming from the front. Hmm? More questions? Thank yep. you. <laughs> My personal feeling before you ask a question is that English has killed Malayalam language. Sorry? English has yeah, killed Malayalam English. language. Yeah, it's English. See, uh, I come from a Malayali family and my parents uh, and my grandparents, they always, uh, you know, praised the old, this empty sage and where they wrote at the Bashir age where it's the golden age of Malayalam literature. So, and right now they sort of lampoon the, the sort of downward trend Malayalam literature. It's in their opinion, it's in the, you know, Malayalam literature is going on a, on a downward spiral or something. So I want to know his, MT's opinion on the current trends of Malayalam literature and where it is going. Hmm? I was asking basically, is the Malayalam literature in general declining or not? Declining. I don't think it is declining. Mm. There will be changes. Every period there will be changes. Language is changing. Yes. Viewpoints are changing. Like that. Uh, Themes the, are changing. Uh, the, the, ma the, the youngster who asked the question, do you read Malayalam literature? Last question, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good morning, sir. My question to C.P. Surindran, sir, as you are the editor. Sir, just tell us that what is the future of language other than English or Hindi in the literature part in the upcoming, con uh, in the upcoming time? Do the youth is going to accept the other language than English or Hindi as the literature or the youth is not going to accept those languages and what is the future of them, the other language? 
Do you actually want a very honest answer? Yeah, that is why I have asked you this question, sir. As an editor, I'm asking the you this question. Yeah, the future of regional language is zero. It's over. Uh, it's over because uh, people have moved from local affirmations to global affirmations. The, the idea of the vanity has become so hugely uh, out of proportion with uh, their own indigenous circumstances that they need to talk to the global self. Rushdie is right in one way because he was talking at one point about conversing with the world through English language. I think increasingly that is going to be the future, unless China does a damn good job and then we'll be all speaking in Mandarin. I think with that we come to the end of the session. As you know, we start the next session very much in time. So thank you very, very much, M.T. Vasudevan, the legendary Malayalam writer, Gita Krishna Kuti, and C.P. Surendran. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for them.